much do you know about the chakras? You probably heard them talked about as the seven main energy centers in your body. You may have heard of them in yoga class, through guided meditation, or in Reiki. Maybe you know a little bit about the chakras, but aren't really sure how to use them to guide you. I'm creating a deep dive into the chakras and color therapy for the next eight weeks. Each week, my guests and I will discuss one chakra, how they've connected to the energy of that chakra through their journey, and how they feel guided or inspired by the energy. Sound interesting? I hope you'll enjoy the conversation. Let's get started. Hi, and welcome to today's episode of Grounding Journey. I am so excited to have my guest, Anne Margaret, here with us. And Anne Margaret is actually a friend of a friend who I've seen a little bit about and was super excited that she had time to come meet with us. So I'm going to give you her formal introduction because it sounds really cool. Um, spearheading the 5D awakening, joining ranks with Abram Hicks, Matt Frazier, and Basher, Anne Margaret's gift of channeling awakening awakened in 2015 with involuntary, sorry, the kitten is in the way of the screen, <laughs> uh, with involuntary movements, which evolved into allowing spirit, spirit to speak directly through her mouth. In hindsight, it is clear that Anne Margaret was being prepared for this gift when she founded a spiritual community and yoga studio in New York City in 2001. It was at the center where she spent 18 years leading, teaching, and developing programs designed to rewire the brain and energetic chakras system. By integrating practical spirituality and archetypal wisdom through their philanthropic work on five continents and 50 U.S. cities, Anne Margaret and her husband, Anthony, have shared their method of powerful alchemization. I'll go there. It's hard to read some of these words when you feel all pressured that everybody's listening. So thank you followers and listeners, uh, pain and trauma to raise the vibration of the human journey. I love that, even though I completely stumbled over it. So Anne Margaret, thank you so much for being here. And now that I have read your official bio, I would love to hear a little bit more about who you are. Who do your friends know you as? Well, thank you so much for having me on this podcast. It's so great to connect with you. And even just the short conversation we had before we started this, uh, was so enriching. So your listeners are very blessed to have you conducting these interviews. Oh, thank so, so thank you for having me. Yeah. Uh, who do my friends say I am? Oh my gosh, that is very candid. I would say they think I am. The first thing that comes to mind is nuts because like <laughs> so, so much of my friendships and my lifelong friendships and the ones that are relatively new. I mean, I have a friend who's 44 years in the friendship making because we've literally mm -hmm. known each other since we came into this world. Our, our mm -hmm. mothers were friends. So when they were pregnant. So uh, my friends, I think that they they think I'm I'm very like a crazy, resourceful uh, generous. And I say crazy or I say nuts because uh, I've always been somebody who stands outside of the box, steps outside the box of what uh, is comfortable, what is more um, mainstream. It's not, was never really an intention of mine, but somebody who had known me for about 35 years, because <laughs> she's known me since I was a child, she's one of my mentors. She said to me one day, she said, you're just a rebel. And I said, I'm not a rebel. Like, what are you talking about? I'm not a rebel. Cause in my mind, rebel was like, break the rules, like misbehave and like break up stuff, you know, just be unruly in my behavior. And I thought, well, I've tried my best to actually be a good human being and, and to bring like a neutralizing energy, a common denominator a presence to wherever I am to adapt and to, uh, you know, allow people to be comfortable in my presence. And then I, and she's like, yes. And the rebel, the rebellious is very strong. And when she said that, I guess it was about eight years ago when she told me that I, I thought, wow, you know, I didn't really ever consider myself to be that way. But I think in the day and age, any, any one of us that has the courage to say, I don't know if that's true for me. Let me see if it resonates. Mm. That's an act of rebellion. And for my entire life, I felt very, very connected to, I'll say God, you say source, whatever you feel comfortable interpreting that concept as. But I've always felt very strong connection to God. I've always felt mm -hmm. an immediate connection. And so when 
the channeling began awakening about six years ago, it really wasn't too big of a surprise, even though my logical brain fought it immensely. Uh, so I think, <laughs> so I always kind of felt like, you know, I don't, you might tell me to do one thing, but it doesn't, that doesn't, my intuition is, is screaming against that. So I think the, the crazy is just being, being somebody who's always been okay marching to the beat of her own drum and doing things that seeming are seemingly uh very risky uh having mm. a brick and mortar in new york city um having it be a healing center i mean it's not a great way to make a ton of cash you know it's definitely <laughs> not gonna move me up the corporate ladder being an entrepreneur but i've never had a i've never had a corporate job my entire life so mm. i think that's that's kind of nutty to a lot of people but my friends are my friends because our hearts match not because we do the same thing in life you know so uh nuts and um and i'm just there for them as well if they ever need me and uh I'm, I'm a very loyal friend too i know zia uh our mutual friend is also a leo and that's something that we share in common is i i am a leo you're a leo too i am <laughs> okay so you You'll get this. I'm the first day, July 23rd. So I'm a okay. cusper on cancer. How about you? August 12th. Okay. Actually, I have a few friends on August 12th as well. It's a very That's good funny. day. Yeah, yeah. But Leos are, are tend to be very loyal. So mm -hmm. uh, that's been one of my faults in life as a friend, yes. being overly loyal. <laughs> yes. But that loyalty in the shadow aspect of that has been a great teacher of mine. Brought a lot of pain, but a lot of teaching with that. So. Yes. That's well, what I think I, my friends think of me. <laughs> I love everything you said. And do you agree that part of that Leo, I was like, uh-huh, uh-huh, that's me too. I should have raised my hand every time you said something that I agreed with, uh, <laughs> because there is so much to that of just not being a rebel in the sense of James Dean rebel, but being in a, <laughs> sense of a rebel of, I listen and I see what resonates with myself instead of what I'm told to do. And so I think that's a good kind of rebel of, of yes. course. It, well, you, you mentioned James Dean rebel without a cause. There is a yeah, rebel oh, with a cause too, right? <laughs> yes. I love that. I love that. Well, so you mentioned that you had uh, your brick and mortar in New York city. And in your bio, we talked about that you started it in 2001. And so I've got a little sense of what kind of your journey has been like, but I would love to hear a little bit more about that journey. Where were you in 2001 spiritually? Because I know that in that 18 years, there's been a lot of growth and a lot of development. You didn't start in 01 knowing all about everything. Oh, you had no. to come to that place. And there was a moment you said, I want to learn more. So tell me where you started. Does that make sense? Yes, it absolutely makes sense. It's a little daunting of a question, but I'll, I'll nutshell it as much as I can, because I mean, each one of us goes through such a journey in our lifetime and, and, um, it's just, I think that that's one of the coolest things of our life is the transform, transformative mm -hmm. opportunity for alchemizing our experiences in life. So uh, 2001, I was living in New York City and uh, I took my teacher training in January 2001, Reiki, uh, started studying a lot about nutrition, diet. Uh, I'm originally from Colorado and moved to New York City upon graduation from college. And in my final year of college, uh, about a mile from where I grew up was the Columbine High School massacre. Mm -hmm. So it happened in April, on April 20th, 1999, right before I graduated and then moved to New wow. York City. And then I experienced, you know, 9-11 uh, living there as wow. well. And so that really made a huge impact on me because all of my life, even in high school, and I'll step back to high school just a little bit because I've always been this annoying child for my parents who was like, why, why, why? <laughs> I want to know everything. I want to know everything. I want to understand it. And um, so I've always been, and I was, I'm the youngest of three and my sister's nine years older. I have an older brother who's five years older. So I am the baby of the family. And I, I always would ask questions of why. I wanted to understand how things worked. And I think a part of that is because my mom is a mathematician. My father is an mm. engineer. And uh, and also my father also taught in Villanova too. So both teachers. 
And because of that, I feel like the analytical aspect of my brain, the left side mm. was not allowed to slouch. I mean, I was literally <laughs> told as a child, you come home with less than an A in math, you'll be grounded because we're here. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so great. So I, I don't know, maybe one year, one semester I probably came up with an A minus, but I don't know. But I was not allowed to be bad in that left side part of my brain. And although mm. I gravitated as a musician to the right side and understanding like expression and, and feeling through the arts and artistic expression. But why I bring that up is I think that that foundation of having parents like I do and the mm -hmm. way that they raised me and, and they didn't always answer my questions. You know, they were annoyed <laughs> by a lot of them, uh, but I was also raised very strictly Catholic too. So it, within the confines of that dynamic, and that certain conviction uh, and methodology or, or theology, I should say, um, it provided a foundation for me that felt really solid and yet it was incomplete. Mm -hmm. So with the left brain and, and having that foundation and then having all of this yearning in my heart for answers, helped me understand the chakras in a way that's very practical. Uh, in high school, I'll say I would go to mass every weekend because I had to, as a Catholic family, we had to attend mass every Saturday night or Sunday. And then I'd also was a bit of a spiritual nerd and went and attended another service every weekend as a high schooler. So that was a little, you know, nerdy. I admit, uh, in high school, you know, when my friends are doing whatever, I'm going to an additional church because I was fascinated by religion. Uh, so when I experienced this in college with, with the Columbine shooting, and then I experienced 9-11 in New York City, uh, I was living like a mile away from each. So it was, it happened, both happened like in my backyard. And I felt in that time period, a great desire in my heart really was implanted and nurtured more so to Kind of solve the riddle of the human journey as arrogant as that sounds <laughs> but i was looking at at the world and even struggles that i had in my own family and in my own my own heart my mind my emotional body like why are we struggling so much why are we failing so greatly at being human and i just felt like that desire to bring heal healing to the world really stirred in my heart and mm -hmm. um so I, you know, started the yoga journey in 2001 in New York and then began teaching out of a little tiny studio with five students and then grew that to like, you know, classes seven days a week workshops out of places I was renting like, a, you know, and then I opened my own brick and mortar, you know, uh, in 2009 right after a, a week after my husband and I graduated from an interfaith seminary and were ordained as interfaith ministers. So that kind of gives you like a whole kind of overview of how, how, why it started. Uh, but mm -hmm. I really didn't start teaching yoga because I, I was so excited about yoga. I was just fascinated about understanding more about the chakras and why we operate the way that we do and trying to, figure out formulas back to that left brain formulas to help us more effectively navigate the human journey. I love that. And I appreciate that you came from a very Catholic background. So I have a question on that. What you said, when you went to an additional service or mass, did, were you going to another Catholic church or were you going to another denomination? I would go, it was always to another denomination so I could learn mm -hmm. other different, other faiths, other practices, other congregations that were, you know, believe different things and had culturally and, uh, you know, in their own, um, in their own foundational principles of their religion. You know, I wanted to learn and be exposed to a lot of different ones, which is no surprise. I ended up in Queens, which is the most culturally diverse community in the entire world. And that's where mm -hmm. I had my, my center because it was just the ultimate melting pot according to the census. So people from all over the world, all different religions, all cultural backgrounds, finding a, a nucleus focused on community and inclusive community through the chakra system as a foundation was the basis for establishing our brick and mortar there and having that community for 18 years. Well, and I love that you you know, because one of the things I have come across 
And just to give you a little bit about my background, some of the followers have heard it before. My dad was a Jesuit brother who at 27 left the Jesuit hood, became a volunteer firefighter, met my mother who was Southern Baptist and 11 years younger than him. And here they are celebrating their 50th wedding anniversary next year. I was, yeah, I I have a very interesting um, religious background. And I remember in middle school, you know, we used to go to Sunday mass. We went to catechism every week. We went to the church that was right by my grandparents, all that kind of stuff. So I was raised that way. And then in sixth grade, my parents allowed me to change churches and set because the church we went to was 30 minutes across town. You know, it was an ordeal to go 30 minutes across town back then. (laughs) And so there was a neighborhood Methodist church and my parents allowed my brother and I to join that church so that we could be a part of their youth group and really be active in it. And Mm. I remember through middle school, my parents supporting me and exploring, learning more. And I think that that's where my curiosity for spiritualness came from one of my most favorite spiritual moments I think about uh, was standing in India and hearing call to prayer and, and just standing there Mm -hmm. and watching all these Muslims filing into the church in the middle of the day. I'm sorry, not church, um, the, into the mosque in the middle of the day Mm -hmm. and hearing it and watching their devout faith. And -hmm. that's one of my favorite things when my husband and I travel because we do so much traveling, we always find the oldest church in town and go sit. The oldest, you know, whatever. I I use church because I was raised Catholic, um, but honoring that it's church, synagogue, you know, mosque, whatever. Yeah. Sitting outside. What a great practice. And I think it's having that curiosity of spirituality. And so I appreciate that we get to have that moment of we were both raised very Catholic Because I do hear sometimes when you talk about spirituality or you talk about yoga, a dear friend of mine, one time when I told her I was doing the chakra program that I was working on, she said, well, how do you believe in that stuff and still believe in God? And and so (laughs) it's nice to to be able to talk about that for a moment of saying it's the curiosity. It's having faith in there is a higher power. There is a universe. There is the cosmos. There is God. I like to call him God because that's what I grew up calling him, you know? Um, and and God is a, her, God is a a force to me, but I do use God and I do use him just because that's Mm -hmm. where it came from. So I I really appreciate knowing where you are now Mm -hmm. that you came from such a similar background. My parents were not good at math though. (laughs) Lucky, I'll just no. throw that out. <laughs> yeah, they were not good at math. <laughs> I never had an A in math. <laughs> oh my goodness! Oh my goodness! Well, you would have been grounded in my home. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have to say, you know, with what you just mentioned, I think it's a beautiful practice to go find the oldest church wherever you are. I think that's beautiful. It's a beautiful way for us to connect with what really was a source of community through history because churches Mm -hmm. and i think that's what we're seeing now is that people are not feeling as resonant with specific a specific religion or a specific church and people are very quick to leave because they don't they feel that something is more in opposition of what they believe and there's a there we see this also in social media land in regular media land like an intolerance for other people being different from us yes and when I meet a lot of Catholics, the joke always goes around, oh, you're a recovering Catholic too. And I think, <laughs> well, I think that that's a hilarious joke. I also think it's something that doesn't serve us as well as it could. If we, we respect the foundation of that background and also honor those who feel very much connected to the Catholic faith or whatever faith that they are connected to in the world, however they are connected. The the more we can respect and allow people to be connected to God in the way that they're connected to, that's actually going to give us more of a direct connection to God ourselves. Mm-hmm. And so when your friend, which is, you know, asking about the chakra system, like, how can you believe in God and believe in that stuff? It's a very common fear amongst people who do not understand what you, you usually fear what you don't understand once you mm-hmm. understand. And I think that that was really at the root of my questioning, like my curiosity. It wasn't just because 
gosh, I was such a brilliant child. Uh, you know, it's <laughs> more like I, things that scared me, I wanted to figure it out because I knew that there, was, there wasn't anything to be afraid of if I could understand. I think that that mm -hmm. was inherent. And, uh, and as, as my parents being teachers, I think that also influenced me greatly with that. So the chakra system, it, it really connects to me in a very practical way to allow us to connect to our own bodies, our, our created bodies, I believe, our miraculous brains, mm -hmm. uh, our, our gift of life, our bestow, bestowing of free will to create our lives as we choose and to honor this gift of life in the best way possible. And one of my favorite sayings is, you know, a little science pulls man away from God, a lot of science brings him right back. And I would mm. say that that's the case with the chakra system because the chakra system is very rooted in science and vibrational frequency. We understand, and when I first saw the chakra system, like in rainbow color, I was like, oh, that's really cute. Cause I have a really skeptical side. It's like a little cynical too sometimes where I'm like, I'm not really here to jump through rainbows with you. I want to understand the practical ways that we can coexist in a more healthy way and be productive and proactive at, at raising the vibration of, of our experience of being human. But you know, all that stuff is good and feeling good too. But I looked at the chakra system and was like, oh, isn't that cute? They all, you know, they're colors of the rainbow. Not understanding that that's rooted in frequency. That's rooted in vibration, mm -hmm. just like the color spectrum from our elementary school days. Roy G. Biv, you know, red has the lowest frequency, violet has the highest frequency, and all of that, it, it kind of is the, the entry point for any skeptic or someone who's afraid of it interfering with your connection to God. From the outside, it's like, ooh, what's that? It feels a little too mystical, or New Age also, New Age has, has a light and a dark, right? People who are in this new awakening of finding their connection to God, finding their connection to purpose and one another and the planet, you can take that and you can manipulate into a very sick, manipulative, um, more shadowy, uh, according to, you know, more demonic, those who, who connect with that word, but more of like the shadowy, darker aspects of our existence. Mm -hmm. Anything can be twisted into that. Yoga can yes. be a religion and be twisted into a really negative source of pain and not just physical pain, but elitist <laughs> pain <laughs> onto the students. So I think it's just a lack of understanding that somebody would draw that conclusion. Absolutely. And I, I think it, it's really great that we can do this series right now for people who have heard of it, who want to know a little bit more about it and break that barrier for people. Because for me, my deeper exploration over the years has not just connected me with their meaning, but it's really connected me with my own divine inside of me. Because having been raised in organized religion, God's up here, he's the higher power, he controls everything, and I'm just a subject. And so for me, really learning all of the elements that are my energy and my force within me has given me that connection to the divine above and the divine within. And I think that's a really beautiful part of the journey. Oh yeah. Beautifully said too. Beautifully said. I remember there was a time when in my in my high school years that I was joining, you know, Bible studies and that kind of thing as well and studying certain spiritual texts. And the thing that kept coming up for me that I think was one of the, the initial sources or root, tap roots of my spiritual journey was the inconsistencies, the hypocrisies, mm. the things that didn't add up logically where I thought, you know, if I was created by God and for this entire world was created by God and all is God and all is good, how do we reconcile cutting this aspect off how do how did the little sneaky devil kind of get out of hell or get out of heaven create hell and like it never made sense to me and i not to denounce evil in the world or shadow or pain yes. or all of this injustice and i mean that is a part of our human existence but for me i couldn't understand how it added up i didn't understand the inconsistencies and when i asked about them the most common response was you just have to have faith and 
you just and kind of like going over that bridge and at the time i really got frustrated by that because i was like that's not an answer um <laughs> like we just let whole... it go if you have to right. say just that i don't know <laughs> i know and i mean we could have a whole podcast you know uh you know episode on faith and and feature mm -hmm. your cute puppy dog too in that mm -hmm. uh but you know this is name faith i don't know if your listeners know that but <laughs> <laughs> some do that some don't she she makes barking appearances in several episodes <laughs> oh no you're safe, you're safe. so the power of faith is extraordinary and not to underestimate that not to invalidate that at all but there for me with a logical brain i i and everybody who's a skeptic and asking questions you ask questions because you want to connect more you want to understand more mm -hmm. we ask questions in our intimate relationships when we want to know more about the other person but in order to ask questions we have to also feel a more of a security in who we are that we're safe enough to ask those questions. And if we're not consistently building our own familiarity and the deepening of our intimacy with ourself, then we're not going to have the courage to ask mm -hmm. questions of some authoritative figures. We're not going to question yes. because, oh, they just know and I'm just too stupid or subservient to even understand uh, what how that might be. And there's a certain level of respect that also we project uh for good reason onto people who've devoted their lives to a particular area of study yet if we invalidate our own inner knowing and the ability to navigate their very human interpretation of whatever that is then we're going to create false idols we're going to face create false gods in the world which i think is why the teaching about false idols is so important right now because we can make a false idol of a of a paycheck of a company of a, a religious figure of a doctor of a friend of a you know even anything we can really raise mm -hmm. onto that pedestal and when we do that we let ourselves off the hook mm -hmm. we don't embody the accountability that we have to be fully responsible for how we're interpreting the world we're not re responsible for the circumstances always. The circumstances happen. We can only right. control them so much, but we really uh, let ourselves off the hook, I think, in, in a very um, enabling, in a negatively enabling way, so that we cannot access our full capacity to create. Hmm. Yes. I, I think that you, you said a lot, so I feel like I need to pause for a moment before I respond <laughs> because I'm still absorbing it all in, especially the part that you said about the false idols. Uh, I think that's very and powerful when you break it down to you because when you said that, I immediately thought of like football players or rock stars. And, mm -hmm. and when you say friends and people near us, that's a whole nother level of, oh yeah, we do that, don't we? And so finding that empowerment of not having those false idols, that's definitely something I'm going to think about for the next few days after we finish this recording. <laughs> I, I think that we're all going through that collectively right now. And that I, I'm writing, I, I have, we're going to talk about books later, but the book, I'm writing two books right now. One book is almost complete, but the second book I'm talking about has to do with our, with, with all the chakras and understanding uh why they're practically applicable to anyone of any faith of any culture of any background that they are mm -hmm. a practical integration of the human lessons that we need to learn in order to grow closer to our purpose to god to one another and to ourselves and the third chakra develops between the ages of eight and 12 years old and the developmental ages and the chakras and everything like anything on this planet have interpretations that vary from teacher to teacher. For me, I've always taught that it develops between eight and 12 years old. It's the third chakra, the solar plexus. Uh, it is the color yellow associated with that. And the themes around that, if you think about eight to 12 years old, you can oh. pay me enough to go back. <laughs> That was exactly my thought. I don't want to think about those years. <laughs> you couldn't, you couldn't pay me enough, right, uh -huh. to go back there. No way. What an awkward time of transition, not only in our, our physical bodies, but just the dynamics of identity. And that's mm -hmm. what we see in 
eight to 12 year olds, we see a shift. Oh my gosh, my little niece has just turned nine and she just entered the third chakra, more development of identity. And when kids leave that like seven, eight precious, like curiosity and, you know, just playfulness and inner child is front and center. And then they get into that next stage, which we all have to go through. We can't avoid it for our kids, right? So don't even try. But it's like when you go into that next level, it's like, ooh, something gets lost and something gets put on. And the Mm -hmm. masks that we put on during that time that are either projected onto us by our parents, by our colleagues, by our students, classmates, our friends, what we expect from what we see around us. Maybe we start dressing up like, one of our favorite singers or we wear black eyeliner because we love that kind of music or it's the time in our lives that we start having clicks that we don't we we get labeled as the jock or the nerd like the labels really start during that time and in the book that i'm writing it's focusing around our collective shifting from the solar plexus identity and hierarchical structures of identity to the heart center, to where we're coming more so into connection with our heart, connection in the heart chakra, which relates to, you know, both, it's where the chakras meet in that masculine feminine dynamic of, of, I could go off on a lot of tangents, but I'll just say that. But the third chakra is what the major dysfunctions that we see collectively right now are related to that. They're related to our dysfunctional relationship to pain, power and purpose. And all of that gets wrapped into identity. If you think about pain, our dysfunctional relationship in that third chakra is avoiding pain. Avoiding pain means avoiding ostracization, like being ostracized, being ousted from the group, from the collective. And the idolatry that we were talking about, projecting a view of, of an identity onto someone as knowing more than you as dominating you know the world in a certain way whether it's with fame with money with control with influence whatever it is so our dysfunctional relationship of relating to our identity will disrupt our complete experience of the world if we're putting a lid on our ability to comprehend we're putting a lid on our experience of the world If we put a lid on pain and try and neutralize pain or limit pain and stay in our pleasure comfort zone, we're going to miss the insane teacher that pain is like the most incredible teacher that pain is to help us purify. And that's the fire center, right? The fire is the element of the third chakra. Fire is that transformative element. It doesn't feel good, but it's what purifies it, what transforms. So, I know I could go off a few more tangents, but I'll stop there. (laughs) Well, it's funny because I just, solar plexus is the one that has me really challenged right now. And it, it was interesting because I haven't really thought back about it being the eight to 12 year old, but for me, solar plexus of where I'm struggling is shining my star, being comfortable talking, being comfortable being seen. And as you and I talked about before we started recording in my full-time gig, I'm so much happier being the girl behind the scenes. And so as you were talking, I was kind of reflecting back about where I was from eight to 12 and what was going on in my life and everything that I'm trying to, and I'm not saying I had a traumatic childhood, you know, I, Mm -hmm. I'm not saying that, but the choices I made about who I was are all playing out now of Mm -hmm. trying to rebuild them. And they all come back from eight to 12. Mm -hmm. And that's really interesting because I just, you know, I've been studying them for so many years. And every time you have another conversation with somebody, you learn something else about that one that you didn't see about yourself before. So thank you for that little tidbit of, yeah, that's, that's right. That's why all that stuff's coming up for me now. So it's interesting. Yeah, absolutely. That's awesome that you can put that together because That's why the chakras are so amazing. They're just a puzzle to figure out, to solve. It's not, Mm -hmm. am I going to be okay? It's understanding our fine tuning, our own unique tuning so that we can fully play as a virtuoso in our own lives rather than 
oh gosh, I'm broken. Or, you know, you brought up like, uh, you know, you didn't have a traumatic childhood. Anybody who comes into this world goes through trauma, goes through massive mm -hmm. trauma and the worst trauma in just coming into this world and being born. More than any trauma that anyone ever experiences in their life, that is the most traumatic of coming into this world. And we're not talking about the root chakra today <laughs> as, as an exclusive focus, but they all interweave, obviously. And when you come into this world and leaving the the interconnectedness, the absolute physical connectedness to the mother and coming into a world of separateness mm. while still kind of feeling that world of oneness. That is the beautiful dichotomy that exists in the chakra system. It gives you the tools to figure out why you are the way you are. Yes. And then, so, you know, you're not and What are you gonna to do with that? <laughs> Well, you know, one of my favorite metaphors is that if you'll indulge me, I'll share this metaphor with you. I think it's something I teach in my chakra workshop and my coaching. It's something that appeals to me as a musician because I'm a classical pianist. I have a couple albums mm. of original music and I'm a singer. And so music and frequency is so, mm -hmm. so cool. And so, so many good metaphors there. So the metaphor here for understanding this is a simple question of if you are a piano, why are you trying to be a violin? So no two pianos in this entire world, something that blows my mind is no two pianos in this entire world tune alike. Now I'm not talking about digital, I'm talking about acoustic pianos, right? So not, not two tune alike. And you ask any piano tuner, you know, when he's coming in or she's coming in to tune the piano, that is the case. There's always a mystery to be solved. And I feel like they're like piano tuners could also write like their own book, like Zen and the art of piano tuning, because you have you have this incredible mystery to figure out when you come into this world is who are you? Who mm. am I? I identity, all of that uh, ego is wrapped up in this third chakra time, which is why it is so profound in our understanding this human experience. you got ancient teachers, ancient philosophers, ancient spiritual masters talking all about this. Who am I? What's my purpose? What's my reason for being here? What happens after this? What came before this? And when we look at, you know, am I piano or am I a violin? Stop being, stop trying to be someone else if you're a piano. That's first step. Second step is know your own tuning. If no two pianos mm. tune alike, what's your tuning? Stop trying to be like that piano, be you. Understand, and this is where the chakras come in. So mm. if you know that that's always the note that you play on your piano and it kind of pops out a little bit more, like a piano tuner designs it so he can tune down that string a little bit, or maybe go sharp or flat, you know, naturally, you understand your tuning and then you can tune yourself. You know the things to do, the self-care practices, the understanding of your chakra system, the mantras you need to keep repeating or the meditations or the prayers, the inc incantations that you need to do in order for you to feel in alignment. Mm -hmm. Nobody can tell you what that feels like. Only you can find that out. So once you know your tuning, then you start learning those practices, those scales on the piano, the framework, the structures that help you understand and refine that tuning and then eventually you get to that place where you begin to play music and express. And that's, I feel, what the chakra system provides is this opportunity to solve the riddle of who you are, always mm -hmm. be in the inquiry, but your own tuning. And then how do you wanna express yourself? How do you wanna create in this world? How do you wanna co-create with God, with others, with the unknown? Well, and I, I love the piano versus violin. I totally wrote that down and I'm going to use that as a quote. <laughs> One of the things that, that I really think in talking about how do you tune yourself, how do you tune versus somebody else? Because I know, and I'm sure you're the same. I've read so many books. I've listened to so many lectures. I've listened to so many different things about spirituality, about crystals, about the chakras, about all this stuff that you're diving into. And one of the things I want to add in when you're figuring out what kind of piano you are and how that tunes is read it all, explore it all and find out what resonates with you that you've read, because there are some books or some people that you're like, yeah, that's, that's not my gig. That's not mm -hmm. who I am. 
but there's other stuff that you will just, yes, yes, yes. And then there's other that you'll pick little bits and pieces out of. And that's because those people who you are reading from, learning from, exploring with have figured out how to tune their piano. And that's one of the important things is as you're reading through, and I think that goes back to the false idols part of what you said, as you're exploring your spirituality and discovering that it's really easy to pick up false idols in your spirituality of, oh, I love this person. They wrote this book. I'm going to read every book they wrote. And that's what I solely believe. So it's really in that honoring how to tune your own piano and finding all the bits and pieces. There, there's a poem uh, that I've, I found it in like ninth grade and it's called happiness and it's happiness is a crystal ball that's been broken and shattered. And you find all the pieces along the way to put the ball back together. And I, I think that's just a really neat way of that's mm. what we're doing here. That's what we're doing through this journey is finding all the pieces to put us back together so that we're that shiny ball. Not that we're broken, like, but mm-hmm. finding all those little pieces that are breadcrumbs along the way. Mm-hmm. Well, the sentiment is beautiful. It's, it's understanding that we already have everything that we need if we stop trying to be something else. Yes. And in order to be accepted, we throw a wrench into the third chakra and start being other things than what resonates with us, what is authentic for us. We step away from truth and that leads to a very dysfunctional fifth chakra and how we're creating our lives and taking our responsibility fully into our own hands. And when we don't, do that it's like we're dry i use for a lot of my clients i use this analogy of driving a bus like you need to be behind the wheel of that bus you can have all the experts or all the archetypes within Mm. you on that bus with you all aspects of who you are or other influences but if you're letting anything any aspect of yourself like any archetype like a hero or the victim or the the student or the teacher any sort of archetype or the damsel drive the bus rather than just influencing you in the very helpful ways that anything can influence you if you're not driving you're in trouble Mm that you are off path if you're letting anything drive that uh can you co-create with life yes i'm not saying that you can control everything in life but if you're putting behind the wheel someone else you are forfeiting your unique perception your unique wisdom your unique uh offering to the world and that is one of the most challenging things i know it you mentioned you're just going through the teacher training certification for yoga, whenever I certify a yoga teachers, one of the main things that I focus on is you can never be in someone else's shoes and no one could be in yours. Never. Yes. And, and that is the curse and the blessing of our separateness is that we want people to get us. We want to get other people and we do connect intimately through our, through deepening our conversation, through getting outside our comfort zones, through growth. And yet we will always be separate. We will never fully be connected in this human experience. And if God, if everything that God created is good, and this is the dynamic we're having, why are we running from pain towards pleasure? Why are we demonizing the villains of the world or the villainous energy rather than just watching our lives unfold like a good superhero movie or a video game? Like, look, this is my challenge to overcome. To be the hero in my story, I need to step up and be that, not wait for another savior to come in and swipe in and save the day, you know? And But how can I step into that? And no superhero is perfect, right? Superhero connected also to what what the Achilles heel it is, is with in that superhero. We always have an aspect that we're we're working with that is is like that Achilles heel, that weakness, you know, like Superman's kryptonite. And yet, if Superman didn't step into his his costume, his, which is just another mask or an archetype mm-hmm. of the hero and allow that energy to come through him and call that God or call that higher power or that calling, then he would never have been Superman. 
and I, I mean, I, I can't share that story without saying, uh, was sharing the story about when I was, um, gosh, I think it was in 2002, maybe 2002, 2003, I went to one of the old yoga journal conferences in New York City uh, when they are first starting. And Christopher Reeves spoke, you know, the original Superman. Oh, yes. And um, it was, bef- it was uh, you know, he was completely paralyzed and could only speak and blink his eyes. Uh, but with every breath he took, it had to be intentional. He would breathe and then be able to say only a few words. So the words that he said were so specific and so poignant. Mm-hmm. And this is a guy who used to be the supreme essence of a man. <laughs> yes. And uh, and to have gone through that journey and his soul moving through that villainous experience of being paralyzed. Um, I mean, that's just what life's about. And the sooner we embrace the villain and the, and the, the difficult aspects of our journey, then we're going to be able to really shine. Yes. I remember when I was younger, dealing with my first mother-in-law and she was a handful. And I, I was in my crystal, my first time I was doing crystal training or crystal, um, crystal healing training. And I made some comment and I said, she was controlled by the devil because I was young and naive and had no idea. and was being completely overrun by my mother-in-law and my crystal healing teacher said, nobody's controlled by the devil. She is the darkness here to teach you light. Hmm. And that was really powerful. So when you say the villain and using that, that's it, it evolutionized my relationship with her because I didn't let her ruffle me anymore. So yeah. thinking yeah. of that, when you come across those things, it is the darkness to teach you light. Yes. It's so beautifully put. And, and when we think about the bullies of this world or, or the villains of this world and those two archetypes, to understand what it means to truly have compassion, we have to understand the chakras. In order to mm-hmm. be able to pull a villainous or a bullying energy and attack it on somebody else or, or uh, you know, inflict it on somebody else, we need to pull that through ourselves. Like in order to love truly and authentically, we need to allow that energy of love to move through that current moving through our bodies through our energetic field in order to share that love so if you think about a bully you know the bully we always say the bully was bullied yes the bully you the bully was bullied so there can be compassion understanding there but also those villains in our lives were like why can't they just be this or that we can't change them we don't know what it's like to be in their shoes get humble about it because the second you're humble about it and you say, well, I have no idea what it's like. And it could be your sibling. It could be your child, your parents, somebody that you feel, your partner that you know really well. But really, you don't. You don't. We don't know what it's like to be in each other's shoes. What we can do in order to have compassion with these villains in our lives is to remember that they're having to channel that energy through them. And that's mm-hmm. they're their own worst enemy. You never treat yourself worse. Or you never treat anyone else worse than you treat yourself. Absolutely. And so if we can remember that they're in that pain, the compassion is so much easier and more accessible. But we still get trapped by the pattern in our brains that we've said this over and over to ourselves is our unworthiness. I'm not enough. Yes. I'm not enough. I'm not enough. And until we recognize that that pattern or that mantra or that belief system is actually a huge source of of motivation in our lives then we can utilize until we do that we're going to perpetually be under the false belief that that is who Mm -hmm. we are versus that's a motivating force so we all have this i'm not enough well how do you stop being not enough (laughs) you grow (laughs) you develop you you know this life and uh and so oftentimes when people are moving through their spiritual journey, they'll get stopped by that. And because they, they adopt it in their third chakra as another label rather than just a false belief that started somewhere along the line to figure out the world around you. For example, like mm-hmm. a two-year-old in a, a bookstore, 
you know, is shopping with his mom. His mom turns the corner to go pay for her book. He looks up and he, he goes, Wah! like he just starts crying and screaming because he has no idea where she is, what happened to her, starts getting this whole experience of it. And in that moment needs to figure out the world around him. So he might have in his mind the thought or just the feeling, the sensation, because we're not saying, oh, this is the way it is. At two years old, we don't really think that way. But we have the experience in that moment of I'm alone. Mm -hmm. And that roots in our brain. It's very scientific. The more you study the brain, I'm a huge brain nerd, but the more you study your brain, you understand how it works and then you can, you can utilize it. The more you understand your patterns, your chakras, your belief system, your emotions, then you can utilize those to live a life of your choosing rather than feeling like a pinball in a pinball machine. So that little kid at two years old says, I'm alone, and then believes that and then perhaps begins to live patterns and manifest patterns through his life to either prove or disprove that through mm. his relationships through his job through his lifestyle etc so we don't know that those roots that start when we're very young regardless of how wonderful or traumatic the childhood was we all are wired in that way. And unless we know that tuning and can go, you don't have to go relive everything. No, I'm not saying that, but to understand, okay, what happened? And then what belief did I create about myself in the world mm -hmm. in face of that? Well, and so two things, I really, really appreciate how much you talk about the fact that you've got a very logical brain and that you're very um, mentally centered as well as spiritual because so often we think, oh, I can't be logical. I'm spiritual or they're, you're one or the other. And it's very obvious that you can be both. So for people who are struggling with that, I think it's really nice to see that it's not an either or. I agree. I agree. And I don't think I agreed with that when I first was going <laughs> to churches, like in high school and understanding, like, I just thought, man, the only way I'm going to be able to be spiritual or religious is to lose my left brain and just mm -hmm. have faith. You have given me so much that I'm like reflecting upon <laughs> and just these <laughs> notes that I've made listening to you. As I said earlier on in the episode, you know, every time you deep dive into a conversation with somebody new about a chakra or about your spirituality, you hear something you've never heard before. And it triggers that conversation within yourself by having these conversations. And so I'm, I'm super grateful for the conversations with you today. Oh, likewise. Well, that's our gift for one another is that we say namaste in yoga class, not just to be like namaste. And that's how we close. Like that's the cadence, right? But you know, it's recognizing the teacher not only within yourself, but in, in every single thing, every single thing in the world. Mm -hmm. And that includes those people that you don't want to say namaste to <laughs> <laughs> or those circumstances right. that you're like, that's not okay. You know, like the, the teacher, it's honoring the teacher within everyone. So that's one of the coolest gifts that we have in our separateness is that we're always learning. We wouldn't know who we were if we were on an island by ourselves. We would have to have some sort of reflection of who we are to know who we are. So that's the gift that we have for one another, each one of us. And it's a beautiful gift. It's an amazing gift that we're able to receive and give to everybody we come across from. And it's kind of where you said, I think actually you said this before we started recording when we were talking and you said, we lay our wisdom at the pedestal of another's feet. And I thought that was so beautiful because that's what we're, you know, part of the beauty of the journey is being able to do that for each other. Mm, definitely. And we get in trouble when we try and shove it down each other's throats. <laughs> <laughs> I'll add that in parentheses. <laughs> uh, well, I am so grateful for your time today. And I'm so excited about the bonus episode we're going to talk about because you are releasing a book about the time this episode is going to release. So I'm, and I, I've had a sneak peek of the book. I haven't gotten to see the book because it's not completely finished, but we're definitely going to talk about that in the bonus episode. And your book is a collaboration of many people who have worked on this book together. And it's like 
book, workbook, devotional, like it's so amazing. So I want to give everybody just enough of a teaser that they're going to check out the bonus episode after this. But Anne Margaret, I'm so grateful for your time. And one of the things that we talked about before we started recording is all that you have planned for the first quarter of 2022 with your new membership site and the journey you went through in creating that. So give us another teaser about what's coming because I want to make sure that all the listeners are definite in following on in on you. Thank you for the opportunity to share that. As a teacher, I've been teaching for about 20 years. I'm not the teacher you come to if you just want a quick pill to solve all your problems because I don't believe that that works. I believe they're gimmicky. Uh, you know, just do this and your whole life will change. Like, I don't, I don't believe that. I believe that in conversations we can transform and our world will never be the same after that. But in order to see lasting results in our lives, we have to look at the patterns that are already in place and then be diligent at reworking our synapses and the way that they're firing in our brains so that we can have a different reality. Because in in very simple terms, what you think over and over again becomes your belief system. And then that belief system shapes your reality, your interpretation of life and the circumstances. That's why no two of us have the same reality. So this membership site comes from the 18 years we spent developing programs, workshops, classes, training programs, events, special events, in our yoga studio in New York City and taking all of that online to be a source of regularity, an inspirational and fun and diligent source so that you can use it to have lasting results in your vibrational alignment. Mm -hmm. Our website is raisethevibration.com, raisethevibration.com. And we focus on the very tangible results of, you know, everything being vibration, your thoughts, what you eat, your everything that the people that you interact with and this membership. So it has the classes on there. It has workshops, it has events, it has trainings. And what's cool about the classes and why they're different is my husband and I, in 2017 to 2019, Anthony and I went on a 50 city tour around the country. We've also taught on five different continents. Like we taught all around the world. And so we have filmed yoga classes, meditations, physical training classes, uh, different folk, uh, different um, uh, group dynamics everywhere we've gone in the great national parks all around our country and in different uh, countries of the world. You mentioned India. That was one of my favorites. Mm. You know, and, and so this, what this Raise a Vibration weekly member or this membership that we're creating to be launched this spring provides is a resource for you to plug in to get healthy recipes popping up for you once a week a healthy mm. mocktail that you can use like in ex- in exchange for alcohol so you can also add the spirit if you want to do that that's fine <laughs> <laughs> some days that you know you want to do that that's fine uh but understanding like what we put into our bodies is so essential when it comes to our frequency and if mm-hmm. our frequency if the measurable frequency in our body dips below i think it's like 60 hertz that that's when we become subjected to illness or disease. And in the time that we live in right now, if we're not understanding that our personal vibration has everything to do with our health and that practical Mm -hmm. application, our thought, a a thought frequency of fear is so much lower than a thought frequency of hope or love or connection or intimacy. So understanding vibration through this website, through all of the different ways that we plug you with uh, information or resources or classes or community can be that regular source to raise your vibration. Well, and I love that that is your your company is raise the vibration because that's definitely what you bring to the table and helping support people in raising their vibration and the education behind how to do that. So if they're feeling lost or struggling, your website, I checked it out before we got on the call a couple of days ago, and your website has so many resources on it and so much to offer that I definitely invite our listeners to check it out at raisethevibration.com. And they can also find you on Facebook and Instagram. Where do you hang out? 
Yes, uh, I do have Instagram. Uh, raise dot the dot vibration is the handle. Raise dot the dot vibration. Uh, I'm on Facebook as well. You can find me there under Raise Vibration, and I have a YouTube channel where I gave I give talks every single week. It's called Sacred Sunday. It's usually like a 10, 15 minute talk on a specific um, subject matter. So you can find that on our YouTube channel, Raise the Vibration. Well, thank you so much for your time. And I know that people are really going to want to check you out because you have such an amazing energy and so much knowledge to share at the pedestal, at the feet of the pedestal. So it's not being shoved down their throats. <laughs> thank um, you so much. Thank you. Yeah. So thanks for being here. And I really look forward to having the conversation about your new book and the bonus episode. Me too. <laughs> it's going to be good. Yes. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for listening to Grounding Journey as we've been discussing the chakras. If you're interested in learning more about the energy centers and how color therapy can guide you on your journey, I invite you to check out my blog at groundingjourney.com. It's there that I share more about the chakras, crystals, yoga, and their connection to your journey. Be sure to subscribe while you're there. Thank you.